Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today I'm excited. We have Ben Settle for the Titans of Copywriting series. A little bit about Ben. Ben is one of the world's top email marketing specialists and he's the creator of the prestigious Email Players Newsletter. He also is the author of the Email Players Playbook and the Blue Chip Email Secrets. Um, so I was reaching out to top copywriters and asked who should I include in this series and I get an email back from David Garfinkel and what he wrote to me was, you need to include Ben Settle, he's the effing hottest email copywriter on the web. So of course I go to Ben's site, do a little research and he's pretty much got testimonials from all the who's who of copywriting on his page and one struck me from Jeff Lerner who said, uh, you want to sell something? Call Ben. Sometimes I don't want to open his emails because they make me want to spend money. So Ben, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, you're welcome. I appreciate you having me on. So I'm excited to hear your big lessons learned, mistakes you made on your journey to success, what worked, what didn't work. And I always like to include a fun fact. Uh, and a fun fact about Ben is he moonlights as a novelist. And your first book is is what, Ben? It's called Zombie Cop. Okay. <laughs> a sophisticated book. Um, <laughs> I, look, I'm not saying it's the best written book, but I do hope people think it's one of the most entertaining books that so, they are they read this year. So why did you choose Zombie? I'm a big fan of the genre, and uh, I have had this idea for the last four or five years just percolating in my brain. And due to some other reasons, I don't want – it's kind of a long story, but I just got real motivated to start it like around last August and – it didn't take me long to finish the first draft. I kind of like it, so I'll be writing more, and uh, it's fun. So what's hard about writing the novel compared to copywriting or vice versa? Okay, that is a very good question, and here's, here's the answer I give everybody who asks me this. Think of exercising, right, your body. You've got your upper body and your lower body. You've got your legs and your arms, right? All this copywriting and emails and all this other stuff, which I'm very used to. You know, I can write this stuff like that. I mean, it's not a problem. Is like my upper body. I've been training my upper body for several years, and I can do this. It doesn't hurt. There's no pain. I just get stronger and better. Creative writing is now I'm like suddenly working my legs, and I have never worked my legs out, and it's painful, and it's slow, <laughs> and it's, oh, man, you can't walk the next day, and it, right. it's brutal getting up and doing it again, but eventually it does build up, and it gets easier, and you know, now I enjoy it. Well, what part, what skills do you use in the copywriting that you that translate to a novelist, even though you're working different yeah. muscle groups? Oh, yeah. Um, structure. Um, I know how to tease people in. And I found that to be extremely helpful in writing a novel. Um, I have a low attention span because I am a copywriter. Um, it just it just works out that way. You, I'm paranoid about boring people. So I have become kind of like the same way. I'm easily bored. And writing a novel now, I, there's nothing in it that bored me. <laughs> just like I would do a sales letter. So hopefully... That'll translate to when other people read it too. But that to me was a big like advantage I think I have that a lot of novelists don't. Yeah. So can you give give us an example of when you tease people in in one of your email copies? Dude, just I do so we day. can picture just so we can picture yeah. kind of like what story did you include or you know, what did you include in it that kind of drew people in? Okay, well, let's take today's email. I'm trying to remember the subject line. It was, very, it was a big hit on Facebook when people read it. Uh you have some controversial subject lines in your I do. in your podcasts. I do. Um, hold on a second. Let me just look this up real quick. Just yeah, so go, I have it. Go ahead. Right. Okay. Here is the subject line. You can't. You cannot save a damsel if she loves her distress. So it's a play on the you know, damsel in distress, right? Hold on. I just want to bring that back up. And so if now I told the story. I told the story about someone I used to date and how she's kind of damaged and she admits it. And I, there's nothing I can do to save her. And then I segue that into the, my audience, which is business people. You have customers like that. You have customers who have pain. They have a problem that you could solve, that your product does solve. They'll buy your product. They'll be enthusiastic about it, and they'll never open it. They'll never use it. And it's frustrating because you, you want them to. Mm -hmm. But they're damaged. They cling to their pain. They like their pain. And there's nothing you can do about it. So just don't let it get to you. Yeah, I like that. I did actually read that that. Um that title and I did read that today. So it, it, oh, did, okay. it did draw me in, I guess. Um, so I also want to know, you know, I mentioned the top of the interview about your blue chip 
book, what is one of the blue chip email secrets you could share? Blue chip email secrets, it's kind of hard to explain because it, what it is is a transcript of a talk between me and my friend Michael Senoff talking about email marketing. It's more the 101 type stuff that I uh. teach. It's not really what I teach in my newsletter or in the book that comes with my newsletter, which is like my advanced system. Mm -hmm. This is like if somebody can't afford it because, you know, it's 97 bucks a month. You know, I, not everybody can afford that. This is for someone who says, you know, I just I need something. They want to get started. started. Yeah. And so it's it's stuff like, you know, subject line stuff and body copy stuff and strategy, you know, writing daily emails, which I advocate and that kind of. I mean, there's a, it's like 80 pages. There's yeah. quite a lot of stuff in there, actually. What, I guess that brings me to what's one of your biggest tips for uh, writing a good subject line? Because, you know, um, obviously if it's it's yeah. bad, someone's not even going to open your email probably. Okay, so there's probably thousands of ways to write a subject line. Um, the th I teach 13 specifically that I use a lot. And probably the most tried and true one, okay, that, that you know, when in doubt, do this. And that is curiosity. Um, I'll tell you why. I'm going to tell you why. There's this guy named Gary Halbert. He's long deceased. He was one of the greatest copywriters who ever lived. I don't think anybody would dispute that. And I had a chance to interview one of his protégés. Like he didn't have very many protégés. Like this was like one of the top protégés. His name's Scott Haynes. And Scott told me the story about they were on a boat one day because Gary liked to go out on a boat. He lived in the Florida Keys and waste time and stuff. And they, that's how you get his ideas. But anyway, uh, Gary quizzed Scott one day. He said, "Hey." What is the most important? What's the most important part? The most important element of a good ad? And Scott said, "What most of us would say: a uh, self-interest." And Gary said, "No, you're wrong. It's curiosity. People will buy something even if they don't need it just because they're curious about it." And I absolutely agree with that because hmm. I've seen it happen. I've got people interested in the zombie book who don't even read zombie stuff, who don't even like violent books, but they're like, "Ben, I don't know what what you're doing to me, but I have to. I'm going to read this book." So, so what did you do? I don't know, actually. I, I, they don't tell me. It's just I think it's just the process by which I'm tr I've been launching it, pre-launching it. I just kind of talk about it. I like, for example, I sent an email out last week about um, how I wrote the book specifically to have 14 chapters, and then each chapter is like seven sections. You know what I mean? If, if, that, if that makes sense, like seven scenes. And I said I did that very deliberately because the number seven and number threes are. It's very easy for the human brain to take in information that's in threes for sure, and I believe sevens as well. And so I, I, I just talked about it, and people are just finding that kind of stuff interesting. And now they're suddenly thinking, "Huh, I think I want to read this." And you know, I, that's my guess. I mean, nobody's really told me what suddenly made them want to read a zombie book when they don't even like violence. You know, so who knows? Yeah. It's so you're opening book. about up about kind of the process too, and not just about the book. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I mean, if anybody's selling fiction, I think this is important. I learned this from uh, Gary Bensavanga. He's like regarded, universally regarded as the greatest living copywriter. Right? Very few people would dispute that. I reached out to him for this and he goes, I turned down my best friends, so I can't yes. do uh, I can't do one with you, but thank you. Well, he, he did an interview with my friend Ken McCarthy like back in 2004. It was a long time ago. Yeah. And he talked about when he just got started in copywriting. I mean, he was as newbie as noob can be. You know, he was scared. He's like one bad boss's bad day away from being fired, right? And he got scared and like, you need to write an ad about the Frank Sinatra Record Club. <laughs> well, how do you do it? It's not like it's an information product. You go in and say, well, how to this? He say he did research. Well, what was Frank thinking when he wrote this song? You know, what was the, what was his inspiration for that song? And he got deep into it. And I think when you do that, when you get deep into any subject, people resonate with that i really yeah. do because there's not a lot of depth out there we're in a very superficial society right now yeah and that brings to me actually like i skipped back to my first question what i always like to ask too is what inspired you what was growing up like and what shaped you um early on in your career well i grew up uh not far from where you're at as we talked about yeah. um in illinois midwest very very plain spoken family. I mean, there's nothing special about us, but I had a couple uncles who have been entrepreneurs and uh, one in particular wanted to get me into Amway. So I was like in high school still at the time and he would take me to seminars and he would give me books, you know, like the kind of books they would give you, just good mindset stuff. And honestly, that's, I didn't want to join Amway. I didn't don't care about that stuff, but it got me thinking entrepreneurially and I knew that I did not want to stay in a job forever. So I started out in MLM, not Amway, another one. And uh, that didn't work out very well, but I eventually got into direct marketing and, you know, 
I never looked back. So what were some of the jobs you had early on in high school or, oh, or after? A lot of retail stores. Uh, I worked at a pottery store uh, and uh, Office Max. <laughs> you know, nothing like a factory jobs here and there. I sold sweaters at a kiosk in the mall. When I got out of college, I went to college for radio television. And I thought I wanted to do that kind of stuff, but I didn't really. And uh, I got a job duplicating videos, which was actually a pretty cool job because I got to get on second shift. And it was actually, you know, the job was actually kind of fun. You get paid to kind of watch TV, basically. You're just recording stuff. Right. And I would get on second shift. This is after I got into copywriting. And I was the only one there. And I'd, I was real fast. So I'd finish my work real fast. And I would, like, study marketing books or copywriting books or write ads out by hand which I recommend anyone in copywriting do, even work on client stuff. So that was actually a really cool job to have. I loved it. Um, they don't use VHS anymore, but, man, sometimes I actually still have dreams about that job because I liked it so much. And it was weird. I, I don't know why I liked it so much, but it was fun. So what were some of the first – when did you transition into copywriting? Uh, well, probably around – it was about 2002 um, when I finally threw in the towel with multi-level marketing because I sucked at it so bad. And I – I can. Here's the. Here's basically the fast story of it. Um, I had gotten a lot of debt in multi-level marketing. I was married at the time to Max's wife, and I had taken her. Basically, I sold her on coming all the way out to Illinois from Washington, the state of Washington, with email. This was back before I even knew what email would do. So you have a, You had a knack for persuasion via email. I, I must have, and she sold everything she had. She came out to Illinois. And, you know, we had this plan, you know, we'd do the MLM business. She'd start this like commercial cleaning business on the side, which she did. And we'd do the, you know, the network marketing business. Well, it didn't work out as like we thought. Nine months later, we were literally homeless in the sense that Whoa. we were living in a two-room office. <laughs> you know, there's no bathroom or, or no shower or anything. And uh, I got one night, I, and, and it was so bad. I mean, it was terrible. We were con our room was conjoined to another office from the landlord, like this older guy. And he'd come in at weird times, use the bathroom, because we had a toilet in there, but not a shower. And he didn't really know we were living there. So to promote the facade that we weren't actually living there, we'd get up around 4.35 a.m. every day and go play basketball at the local gym then come back around 7.30 after he's there, act like we're just arriving. You know what I mean? Wow. And it was really embarrassing. I didn't want my family to know or my friends to know. And one day, I'm just sitting there. It's like 3 a.m. I'm plagued with insomnia. And I'm like, God, I'm just praying to God. I'm like, this ain't... I I, I can't do this MLM, so obviously I'm not good at it. We were trying to like recruit people by passing audio tapes out door to door, business to business, which is like, I mean, you talk about hostility. And then uh, that night, I just kind of got up, went to my bookshelf into the other room of the office, it was two room office, and I found this book that I'd read several times that I actually gotten sent to me from the MLM company I had been with, which is kind of interesting. It's called The Seven Lost Secrets of Success by this guy named uh, Joe Vitale. And it's about this old school advertising guy named Bruce Barton. Now, Bruce Barton was like a was like a household name back in the early 1900s. I mean, everyone knew who he was. He's advising presidents. He was running for Congress. He's the other B in, in the big ad agency, BBDO. And uh, he's just a well-known guy. And he used to have people come to him for advice. So this is like when the economy was really bad back in the, like 1919 or something. And some guy came to him, and he was a sales manager. And he tells the story in the book. He was a sales manager who had like a talent. His reputation for was writing sales letters. And he came to Bruce Barton and said, man, I can't find a job. Help, what should I do? So Bruce Barton takes him to the window. I think they were in Chicago or some, some big city. And he said, look at all those buildings out there. He goes, you are supposed to be good at writing sales letters. Write them a letter on hiring you. And there was something about that story that just clicked with me. I'm like, I could do that. I could do copywriting. And that night I got on the internet and I found the Yannick Silvers and the Dan Kennedy and the Gary Halbert. And it's just been like a rabbit hole ever since then. I've never stopped looking into it. It's fun. Yeah. So how did you get out of that? Because even reading that book and, and kind of researching, you're still in this, you know, this situation where you're in, in your office. Two bedroom yeah. or two room office. How do you then get out of that or and change your mindset? Because that's a pain. Well, that sounds like a painful period. It was, and that's what you know. It did. About six months later, we were able to actually upgrade to a cabin <laughs> and then this lady's property, worth the shower at least. Um, but it took a few years to get really good at copywriting. A lot of studying, a lot of mistakes. It, it, you know, I'd get client work here and there. I use like Elance or something, and I would take all the money I'd make from that and invest it in more copywriting or marketing training, 
which you know a lot of people don't understand it's an investment you have to invest that back in your business yeah. you don't think of you got to keep a job or whatever you got to do to live but at first sometimes you just got to keep reinvesting back in your own education it compounds on itself yeah and then yeah. eventually you're like oh i'm getting clients i can do this yeah so and again like you have this laundry list of people on your site how did you get some of your first big clients uh, well, the the first main client I got was my friend Michael Senoff. Of, he's hard to find seminars dot yeah. com. I listened to that. He, it was a good interview. Yeah, yeah. Was, and, and you know, he's done a lot of interviews, just like you're doing. And he got real big doing that in his own niche and everything. And he contacted me one day because I promoted his hard to find ad site. I didn't even know who he was. I mean, I just loved that site. It was a big swipe file site. Mm -hmm. And uh, he he contacted me. We got to talking. He's like, well, you know, I've got this product here. Would you like to partner on it? You write the ad, and we'll just split the we'll send it to my list, and we'll just split it 50-50 on the sales. And I said, "Yeah, man, let's do that." Because I didn't really want to take client work on, like for fee client work. I should have at the time, but I just didn't want to. Why not? I just I hate authority, and I already had a job, and I didn't want more authority. I wanted more of a partnership thing. But looking back, I should have. I would have actually been a lot better. But I did it, and it was a big hit. That one product, act. I mean the commissions that I was getting were helping me pay off debt. I paid my car off. I mean, it wasn't like a lot of money, but when you're in that situation where you're really broke, paying off a major debt is like a huge deal. And I was able to do that. I was, In fact, uh, we were able to move to the West. We wanted to get out of Illinois and we moved to uh, Southern Utah. That's where I started off from after Illinois. And then I worked our way up to the coast. And that's you asked earlier about how I ended up on the coast. Right, because you're in, after you're in summer, Oregon you're now. Desert, dude. You're, the coast looks pretty good. <laughs> you know? So, yeah. So, I mean, you said it wasn't work-related, but I still have to ask because you're sure. invoking my curiosity here. Of, oh. So, why Oregon? Well, she her family was in Washington. And I said, well, I don't want to live in Washington, but I'll look at Oregon. And you're still together at the time. At that point, we were still together. And yeah. we drove the whole – and I go, if I'm going to be in one of those states, I want to be on the coast. Um, you know, Chicagoland is very flat and boring, man. I wanted to go where there's – Plus, it's freezing here. It's freezing, right? And so we went down – we drove the entire Oregon coast and ran into this town called Golda Beach, which is like 35 miles from the uh, border of California. And I just I just fell in love with it, and we lived there for several years. Then we moved up to a town called Bandon, which is like an hour north on the coast, and then Long Beach, Washington. And she wanted to keep inching closer to her family up by Seattle. Um, right around then, we had our divorce. This is 2011, uh, late 2011, and then I came back to Gold Beach because <laughs> I loved it. And then uh, just a few months ago in October, I just got too isolated out there because I was like the youngest. Not the youngest guy in town, but is there's now a lot. Like, like people it's all retiring? retirees, dude. Oh. The, the the joke is you go to that county, Curry County, to die. And it's, it's not a good, not a funny now. joke for you. Yeah. So yeah. I, exactly, but I had a good friend over here in Roseburg, Oregon, which is about two, about an hour and a half inland from the ocean. And this town is nothing to write home about. But I had good, you know, I had a good friend here. I made some other friends here, and it's, they're trying to build up the entrepreneurial community here. So I came here, and so that's where I'm at. I'll probably finish the year out here and find somewhere else to go. This isn't home either. Yeah, I might go back to the coast. I, who knows? <laughs> we'll see. Well, so tell me. So Michael Senoff was your first big client. Yeah. So when did and how did you get your next next set of big clients? Uh, well, I kept that model going where I would just work for commissions, mm -hmm. and that only really worked with one other person, a guy named Ken McCarthy, who's like the I call him the founding father of internet marketing because really there was a time back in like the early 90s, like 93, 94, where guys like him and, and like-minded people could fit around a small table and everyone was laughing at them. You can't make money on the internet. You can't do any of this stuff. But he did. And it's because of guys like him, not just him, but other guys like him and him. The reason they're the ones that really got this whole internet marketing thing going and, and made people realize you can do this. He was like Dan Kennedy's internet marketing guy for a long time. So how did you hook up with him then? Uh, he had read one of my he read my website and I you know I write a lot and he goes he was just like impressed he's like you know Ben I you know I enjoyed reading your articles on your site this came out, I've never met the guy he just came out of the so blue. people just find your website they like your writing and they contact you yeah that's how I got most of my clients pretty wow. much all my clients all came to me it's positioning and. After that, I got some. After I worked with him, I definitely got some bigger clients. Um, a guy named Mike Dillard in the MLM world, not selling MLM, but selling how to market yourself if you're in MLM. I have a that was back in 2007, 
and I still have a control with them, uh, several controls, I think. I think I don't think anyone's ever there beating any of my ads. Wow. And I wasn't even, I don't think I was even really all that good back then. I mean, it was okay, but I guess I did something right. And uh, guys like him, and I, I, met, I worked in the golf niche and the biz op niche, and probably one of my favorite clients is a guy named Captain Chris Pizzo, who used to be the world leader in self-defense, but he stopped selling those products. He's in something else now. Wrote a lot of his ads. I think I wrote an ad for all of his products, stuff like two, and like all the supplements he sells. I mean, it was crazy. Yeah. He just kept hiring me. So, but, so well, you know, with the control, you said, you know, there's a lot of controls you have out there with Mike Dillard. What do you remember that you included in there and why that worked so well? Okay, well, what I would do, um, I had this, when I started working on his stuff, um, well, not right when I started, but I've always been, around that time, you mentioned David Garfinkel. And I, I, I told David this when I first met him. I said, dude, you, you said something that really changed the way I write ads. And it was nothing like, this is not some ninja thing. It's not some technique. It, it, it's actually a very simple thing that I just needed to hear. He was being interviewed by this copywriter named John Ritz, who's deceased a couple of years ago. And David said something on this interview. Uh, he, was, he, he was asked something about the language he uses in ads. And David goes, I'm not really so concerned about the jargon I'm not so worried about the problem people have. I want to know the language and the actual words the prospect uses to describe the problem. And that was like a light bulb moment for me. And I started implementing that. And, it, I st and I, I'd also interviewed a couple of A-list copywriters, like world-class direct mail guys, um, Doug Deanna and David Deutsch, like two of the best out there, for a book I'd written at this, around that same time. And this was all kind of coming to head. And both of them kept wrenching, wrenching on this. I interviewed them for this book. So it was like a transcript. It's the market. It's the market. He, and David Deutsch told me, you know, David Deutsch has like several controls going all the time for the big mailers. I mean, he's so for people who don't know what a control is, just explain briefly. Okay. Yeah. Okay. A control is like two people write an ad for the same product and one ad makes more sales than the other. That's a control. And that person will keep getting royalties off the sales of that sales letter um, until someone beats that control. Right. And yours just keeps beating any other, any other test that they put up against well, yeah. yeah, for the for the, the Diller thing, kind. Of, yeah. I mean, I don't get paid royalties on that stuff, but it's a control. It's just nobody's really been able to beat it. They can modify it a little, right? But uh, those two kept wrenching on the market. In fact, David Deutsch told me, he goes, you know, when when the A list guys are talking to each other, like the best of the best are talking to each other, they're not going, hey, did you use that NLP technique, or you know that, did you use that like ninja trick for copyright? He goes, no. What we're talking about is the market. Do you know what words they're using now? Do you know how they're describing this problem now? Do you know what they're, this is what they're worried about now? This is what they're talking about now. This is the TV shows they're watching now, and it's all about the market first. And Doug Dana has this really cool quote that I love: um, "Copywriting is not building a bridge from your product to your prospect. It's building a bridge from your prospect to your product. It starts with the prospect." And when I started doing that in that mindset, and I started really. I would not even care about the product I was selling. In fact, I went into the golf niche not far long after that, and I did this in the self-defense niche too. Um, I would write 90% of the ad, everything but the actual product details, without even seeing the product because it was about the market. I didn't even know anything about golf. I had to be like educated on it, and I just took what I knew, and I mean, we killed it when I was working with these guys and because I started with the market. So what it's did really you discover that. in the golf? Like what was the link, some of the language and what you discovered in the golf uh, arena. Well, you know, the golf is a very interesting market. It, it's a it's a very hot market. I think people, if you have skills in, in marketing, you should go into it. Um, same with the dating niche. Same thing. These are hot, passionate, on fire people. They really are. It's weight loss, uh, female weight loss, same way. It's just a passionate niche. And I, you know, what I learned is there's several subsections of the niche of all these niches. So it's not like you. The jar, like I wouldn't even use jargon if I was going after beginner golfers. I don't know what I don't even know. I still to this day, and I play golf, still don't know how to do a handicap. I don't even know what it means. So if I'm talking to a beginner, I'm not even going to use the word handicap or, you know, slice and all this stuff. I mean, you, you have to know your where what where you're at in the market. Eugene right. Schwartz wrote Breakthrough Advertising, big awesome book. Kind of, it's a very hard book to get through. I think I read it like 15 times before my mind, literally, before my mind got around it. He calls it different stages of awareness. And this is another important lesson for someone to know if they're writing ads. How aware is your market of the problem? Do they know they even have a problem or do you have to tell them about the problem? Right. 
you know, and what solutions have they already looked at? How sophisticated are they as far as what they've seen already? And these are like little things, but add up big, especially in big mass markets. Yeah. So in the golf, what problem were you talking about? Oh, man, there's so many problems. In golf. You know, at the end of the day, what it comes down to in golf, this, this is this is my opinion. I'm not in that market anymore. I'm sure you could talk to someone in that market. They may give you a different answer and maybe they're right. Just go on with my experience. People talk about they want consistency and all this, but really they just want to be able to hit the ball far and straight. They want to be able to hit it far but not have it land in the parking lot. <laughs> right. you know, they don't really care about consistency and all this stuff. I mean, they do, but if you take surveys, they'll tell you this and that, but really they just want to crush the ball. That, that's right. what Right. That's what I want to do when I go play golf. <laughs> right. It. it looks cool. <laughs> yeah. You know? So then how do you transition, Ben, from the client work to your own work? Because I know that was a big step, right? Yeah, it was. And I'd always been, I hadn't always, but as of around 2009, I started selling my own product, which was a copywriting book. And I started creating other little eBooks and stuff because I, st I do realize that I wanted to be my own client eventually. Right. I don't want client, right? Like, I hate authority. I, I really don't deal well with authority. Um, I can put up with it if I have to, but I don't like it. And what happened was I was trying to do these hybrid deals like I did with in golf where I'd get paid a, a royalty on the sales as I helped them do stuff. And it didn't really work out with them. They turned out to be a little, in my opinion, dishonest. That's being nice about it, but I don't want to go into that. Um, and then, but I also, I, at, shortly after that, I went with this other company. Um, I don't think they're around anymore, but they... They sold. They were called Carbon Copy Pro. It was not MLM, but it was in that arena. It was direct selling, <clears throat> and I had a similar deal with them that went fine. But I realized when I was working with them, I didn't. I hated it. Not because I hated them. I liked them. They were great people. I hated not building my own business. And so right you have around, to kind of take their feedback and implement it where maybe you would have done things differently. It's it's not just that. That's part of it. It's just the whole idea. I'm not a team player. And so you have to be a team player to do this stuff, and I'm not. Um, I'm just. I'm just not. It's. I don't know what it is. There's this movie called Vision Quest. It's about a wrestler. Have you ever seen that? No, I haven't seen it. Oh, okay. Well, I mean, he. It's interesting. There's. He's trying to cut weight to to like wrestle the best guy in the conference. It's just just what he wants to do. He's 18th year. That's what he wants. This is his goal. And the team's like, well, yeah, but state your own weight so we can like win conference. Like you're you're not a team player. You know, you're not doing this for the team. And, he, and he's like, screw this. He goes, when you're out on the mat against someone bigger than you, stronger than you, faster than you, there's not a whole hell of a lot a team can do for you. It's just you. And I used to be in wrestling and stuff, so I understand that mindset, and I think it just carries over. Mm -hmm. So I'd rather just work on my own stuff. And at the end of 2010, I was working with these Carbon Copy Pro thing, which, again, great people. I have nothing bad to say about them. You quoted Jeff Lerner. He was my manager, the guy managing my stuff at the time. That's, that, the guy's great, and I respect these guys. But I didn't like, I didn't like, I had this gut, like, like, feeling in my gut. Like, I need to get my own thing going. I, I had products going. I was selling a print newsletter called the Crypto Marketing Newsletter for $27 a month. It wasn't a huge money maker, but it wasn't enough to live on. Something, so I made this, like, game plan for 2011. I said, I'm going to, by the end of 2011, I'm going to be doing all my own stuff, no client stuff. And I came up with some ideas. I implemented some stuff that did not work. <laughs> unfortunately because uh google changed your seo rules it was based on so article. talk about that for a second before going to the next because sure. that was that's kind of in my questioning which is now i don't know what worked but we want to know what what didn't work because we'll probably i'll probably go out and try that next week so what okay. what didn't work for you at that time okay well one of my business partners at the time uh, in the weight loss niche um we were partnering on selling his stuff you know ebooks and stuff um he for a couple of years, he made a pretty nice income doing absolutely nothing. And I mean literally nothing. Maybe issuing a refund. That's <laughs> like his job, right? And he had did this system where he was making like 70 grand a year doing nothing because he wrote like a thousand easing articles in a very specific way. SEO it wasn't complicated. It was very simple. And it was, it was all based on just writing these fast two, 300 word articles. And it worked for him very well. And I wanted to take what he did. He was selling an ebook, or what was just he an ebook? No affiliates, no back end, no nothing. It was an opt in page and a sales letter, an ebook. That's it. And he was making like seventy grand a year. He said he just played with his kids all day and he just living the life. 
those sales started going down for him. That's why he approached me to like joint venture and like figure something out. But I'm like, I want to, I want to do that. Like, on the, I could do that. I could get something like that going. By yourself, yeah. Yeah, I, I could get something going, and, and then I, I wouldn't have pressure. I could work on other stuff. So I tried it, and I worked like a slave for like a month and a half. It was January through mid February 2011, and I, I, I wasn't sleeping. I mean, I was writing like 20 articles a day sometimes. Plus my other work I do. I mean, sometimes I would literally not sleep. I was too wired to sleep. I was exhausted. All this work, and I started seeing some some uh, results, and then I, I went on vacation basically after that to my dad's, and suddenly Google decides to slap article directory. <laughs> and I went from getting a few sales a day, which is like a nice, I was starting to get some to zero. I was on page ten of everything. You know, I got down. I'm like, ah, shoot, now what? And I thought of other things. I couldn't think of anything else. A couple months later, I'm driving up the coast, and I get this idea. What I was starting to get known for email especially like people really wanted to know more about what I was doing with email. I didn't have an email. I did have a product, but you know, I didn't really think that I would teach it too much. You know, it was like one of many products and people just kept saying, saying, so I eventually said, why don't I, I don't know where this idea came from. Why don't I do a print newsletter about email marketing? It's specialized knowledge, which means I can charge more. And I do, I charge 97 bucks a month for it, which is, to me is still a steal. It comes out to like $3.23 a day. So like even a bum on the street with a cup hanging out can afford <laughs> technically. And everyone I talked to said, no, Ben, you can't do that. There's a disconnect. You know, you can't sell how to email and print. You would, once you sell that via email, and I said, no, you guys are kind of missing the point. It's like saying you can't get copywriting clients by using the phone. I mean, it doesn't matter. So you'd actually um, just, mail out like a, a physical letter or how does it work? Yeah, it's a newsletter. It's oh. a 16-page newsletter. Got and it. I like, add some bonus stuff in there. And I, I decided I'm going to do it. I don't care what anyone says. So I started using this like launch process, which I've kind of developed over the years. This was in June and July. And honestly, man, I would have been happy. I would have been ecstatic with 15 or 20 subscribers when I launched it. I ended up getting 80-some subscribers oh, wow. on launch. I was done. At that, I was able to say, hey, I'm not doing client stuff anymore. That's more than I would need. So how did, you get, how did you launch it to get that number? That's kind of a long process. I mean, that, that's like a whole 16-page issue and actually more like 20-some page issue. I think issue I have until midnight tonight. No, I'm just It's a lot. I'm just it's, trust me, we put all these guys to sleep. And... You know, it's based on writing a lot of emails and, and building up to the sale. And I don't do social media stuff when I'm launching. I don't do anything that the launch experts say to do. Not because it, they're, what they say doesn't work. I just don't want to mess around with blogs and comments and Facebook and joint ventures and affiliates. Right. No. It's, so this was to my own list of like 5,000 people. And I mean, I haven't looked back since. And I now I try to do – and by the way, that just answers one of your other questions. Like which campaign was most successful? Yeah. I consider yeah. that. Because I don't know too many people who can do it, who do that, and so I'm proud of that. And you know, to this day, I still have twice as many subscribers of this ninety-seven dollar newsletter than I did to my twenty-seven dollar newsletter. And people are looking for quality, and that, you know, I mean, I haven't had to do client work since, and God willing, I never will again. <laughs> so it sounds you know? like Ben for that. I mean, there's a lot that goes into it, obviously. What was one thing that you found was really effective? Like if someone's launching something now. What would you say? Use this. You know, obviously, there's a long process to it. But yeah. What's one thing that they should consider? Well, just email. That's all I use is email and a sales letter. And what I would do, and here's the basics of it. I mean, this is not complicated. You put a squeeze page up that just it doesn't have to be fancy. It's just a squeeze page where they can put their email address in, and you say to be notified when X Y Z product is ready. Put your email address in here. And if you really want to make it better, you know, tell them what they'll get if they're an early bird buyer, you know, half off. Like in my case, I gave $20 off, which $20 a month over time adds up. Yeah. And uh, you do that. And you do that for like a month, as long out as you can. Now, it's not easy to do that for everybody. It depends because you got to sell your other stuff too. But I was able to do it. And you just keep sending people out. You, you pitch that every day in your emails. You, know, you, say, you just keep teasing people over there. And this does two things. One, it gets – First of all, you're going to find out what kind of interest there is in your product. If nobody signs up on the sub list, then you know you're probably you're probably dead in the water. At least with your main list. Two, you're gathering the the best, the most interested people into one list, a sub list. It's not your main list. So when you launch, like when I launch, I'll hit that sub list seven, eight times during launch day. My main list maybe two or three times. I don't want to bother everybody who's not interested. Right. But the interested people just I just wrench at it. I just I'm aggressive, you know. And that's like the basic basic 
basics of it, but yeah, that's right. the basic overall structure of how I launch. So, you know, about the successful campaigns, that was one. What was mm -hmm. one that obviously before you brought it to your own uh, products that what was a successful campaign and what was effective about it with some of your client work? Uh, well, the golf thing, we started from scratch, and I remember getting emails from one of the guys running it, like, Ben, you just saved us from going out of business a couple times. Because they didn't really have their numbers figured out. They were selling a physical product at a price, and they didn't take into the overnight shipping and all this stuff. And they were, like, losing money if they didn't make a certain amount of sales every day. Mm -hmm. And I kept, I, I was like, hey, let's send two emails a day. And we did. And they, they fought me at first, but, you know, eventually they got to listen you know, to the copywriter <laughs> eventually. And... That was successful in the sense that it kept them going. And now I'm not going to name who they are, but they're probably the biggest golf company on the internet uh, selling information. Certainly one of them. So you so, recommended increasing the frequency of email. Yes. What else? Oh, yeah. Uh, man. Well, to not back then, and this is still going on these days, but a lot of these guys will study these gurus who will, who will recommend moving the free line. Okay, and that is where you're always giving away lots of free stuff. Because so, and the theory is that you do that, and people will trust you. And then when you have something to sell, they'll buy from you. You know, I'm not saying it won't work, but it's not selling, and it doesn't work nearly as well as actually. What I say, uh, I don't want to put it this way without sounding like I'm not manipulating anyone, but I give the illusion that I'm giving away lots of information, but it's really not. In other words, I will say what to do, but not how to do it. I don't give anything away for free that's in my product, except for very rare circumstances. And it's not because, oh, I want to manipulate Like on this interview. No. Well, it's, I'll give you the reason why, though. I, my philosophy on business is to serve the market. If you gave away everything you had for free, nobody's going to use it. <laughs> They're not right. going to... The value, value of it is diminished. It is, okay. and they won't yeah. consume it. And you have to live, right? I mean, that's the way it goes. People who pay money for stuff are going to value it and use it. And I'll give you a real-life example. Back when I was struggling, 2003, um, I'm a big Gary Halbert fan. He sold his boron letters, which you can get on Kindle for like 9 bucks now. It's free, on the, I think, on his website now. Back then, you could have to pay $97 for it. This is $97. I don't even remember how I got it. I really don't. Like, I don't know what I did to get this money. Maybe I stole it. I don't know. <laughs> I didn't steal it, but I'm just kidding. Anyway, that I took that information so seriously. I've read it probably over 50 times, this book. I copied it out by hand because <laughs> I wanted to get – I just wanted to like master this information. And I actually thought about this recently, and I know I can attribute tens of thousands of dollars in sales to that book. Now, had I gotten it free, I wouldn't even have probably barely looked at it. So he did me a favor by charging it and making it hurt, actually. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So, not, yeah. and I don't recommend people going into debt though over this kind of stuff. I really don't. Yeah. And I tell people that don't buy my stuff. If you're going into debt. It's not worth it. Get your house in order first. Right. Get your finances in order. So Ben, what about that? You know, that's successful campaigns. What was some stuff, even what you know now, that failed and why? Like it didn't work as as you thought it would. You know, I've I've been thinking about this question all day since you sent me the sheet, <laughs> and I can't think of anything that's really failed that bad. Not because I'm some great, you know, at this, but I've always chosen products that have a market. I've chosen markets that have an have like a desire for this solution. And ninety nine percent of the battle is finding what Gary Halbert would say the starving crowd. Like, if, and he, his example would be if you sold a burger. What advantage would you like if you sold burgers? The best burger, the best recipe, the best location you know, whatever, best price. And he said, no, you want a starving crowd. Right. <laughs> You're going to sell more burgers to a starving crowd than even if it's a crappy burger. And so I've always looked for starving crowd. I don't sell stuff unless there's a market for it. I guess then maybe, let me change the question for you then. It, what was a tweak you made that made it even better? That you found improved, like one of your controls, improved that control even more? Hmm. I've never actually had to improve on a control, so it's kind of hard to answer that. How long do you spend on, yeah. like, let's say, when you come up with the, a Mike Dillard letter or, or someone else for the control? What's your process? Um, well, I haven't. I don't do client work anymore, but when I do, I mean, for your own. I mean, for your yeah, own no, stuff. I'll just, yeah, I'll just, I'll just pretend like I'm still doing client work for this question. Otherwise, because if you, for myself, I'm far lazier and sloppier than I would if I'm doing it for someone else. <laughs> um, I, I have this, these questions I ask about the market, 
and about the product. It's several, it's like 17 pages worth of questions. And I get inside the head of their market, like we were talking about earlier, so that I know them like I know my own best friend. And I also pick markets now that I know. I, I wouldn't go after a market I don't know anymore. I did, it's too much work. But I still want to know that person's market, what they know about it. And I get into that customer's head. I know what they're thinking. Um, I profiled them like an FBI would profile a criminal. I, I, know, I know what they're scared of. I know what their secret deep secrets are. I know what they're secretly wanting, but they'll never admit it to anyone. So I know all this kind of stuff, and I get in their head. And it all starts from there. I don't even look at the product stuff. I mean, I might glance at it, but really, and I'll, and in most cases, depending on the product, I'll tell a story about someone who has the problem they have. And I'll walk through all the frustrations that they're feeling, that I know they're feeling and that they're going through on a daily basis. And I'll get them, like, nodding when they're reading. You know, like, yeah, that's me. And then I'll transition into, but I got a solution for that. You don't have to be in this pain. You don't have to be struggling with this. You don't have to be scared of this. You don't have to keep desiring this thing that you don't have. And then X, Y, you go into the product. So my sales letter format is very simple. You may have seen, like, people with their... 36 point checklist of how they write a sales letter or whatever. Mine's five. <laughs> it's headline, opening sentence, story, bullets, close. Now, that doesn't lend itself to every product out there. Mm -hmm. Okay, but for most pro information products, it definitely does, or even supplements I've learned. And it's real simple. I keep everything simple. I learned this in the golf industry. I learned this from the golf guy whose stuff I was selling. He's big on keeping the angles of your swing to as few as possible. Keep it simple. Golf is a game of angles, he says. The fewer, the better. So I, I take the same approach to when I'm selling. I right, want as right. few things. To, I don't want to be thinking about, oh, do I got to add scarcity in? And no, that all comes naturally if you just know how to sell. Yeah. yeah. So what was something that you found that some market was scared of that surprised you? Oh, well, I'll tell you what, in the weight loss industry, this is a very interesting. You smile. This is going to be a good one. <laughs> well, it was, and I don't, I don't, I, I smile because to me it was very interesting and it gave me an advantage. And some people would say what I, the stuff I was writing was kind of mean, but it wasn't mean because I wasn't mean about it. I did not do it maliciously. I would go on the internet and I would read forums where heavy women would congregate and talk about the problem. You know, they're, they're, I mean, it's not easy being an overweight woman. I have a lot of empathy actually for them. A lot of them have bad hormones, and no matter what they do, they can't lose it. And they're getting made fun of and snickered at behind their back. Their husbands are losing desire for them. All this, they're scared of losing their husband. I mean, it's not easy. It's really not. And then they have the culture, you know, everything on TV, everyone's skinny and all this, and they can't live up to it, and it's stressful. I mean, I, do not, I feel bad for them. But I was reading one of these forums once, and, and I don't mean to smile. It's not funny, but it was like I smiled because it gave me an advantage. Like, like aha. You got an insight. Got, yes, I got an insight. And in this particular case, they were a whole thread about how people would are like their so-called friends, you know, the passive aggressive friends who really aren't friends, but you know, girls don't like to ruin relationships, so that's why they never really get in cat fights that much. They just do passive aggressive stuff. And uh, these these ladies were being their their heavy pictures were being tagged in Facebook by their friends on purpose. So that all their friends would see their heavy pictures. Now you know what? That, that sounds crazy. I wouldn't even think that mean, would happen. Right? That's freaking mean, man. That's like a cruel thing to do to someone. Yeah. And so I would. I, that's one example. I wrote an email about it, and it got us lots of sales. It got us a lot of unsubscribes and angry complaints. I wasn't malicious about it, but they don't see people are very sensitive about. It. That's how you know you hit on something when people are very. If you see the cash register ringing, and you see a lot of people getting mad, you're doing something right. And there were little things like that, and I like I found out there. A lot of them are very insecure about their driver's license picture. You know, hmm. like they like one of their motivations is to have a better looking driver's license picture. They want to lose that weight. And so these are little motivations that people aren't picking up on. But using email, I'm able to talk about these things. I don't have to I didn't mention any of this stuff in the main sales letter. This is just stuff I'd mention in emails to get them to the sales letter. And I call it um this sounds cruel, I'm about to say, but this is what I do. I find out a market's insecurities right, right. and I rub salt in it. I'm going to find out. It's, it's no different than if you're talking to someone on the street, man or woman, it doesn't matter. And you say, God, you know, those shoes look really cool. What's that thing on your nose? You know, and now they're thinking about that thing on their nose all day. They're looking in the mirror. They, you know, they're asking other people. You've got them thinking about it. Now, you're not you on the street. You're doing that to be kind of a jerk. But in the market, you're actually saying, hey, 
What about that other aspect of your problem that they don't really want to talk about, but it's there and it's, it's like bubbling in their mind. And now you bring it out and they're thinking about it and you're showing them a solution to it. You're doing them a favor by doing that. I mean, it sounds weird, but you're doing them a favor. They're going to take action now and they're going to buy yeah. a product that is good, hopefully, and they can solve that problem. Yeah. That's the approach yeah. I take to these things. No, no. Thank you for sharing that. That is valuable. And yeah. it's har- probably it's hard to do, too. but you know, in the end, if you have a solution that what's going to help them, you know, that, yes. you know yeah. that's what's going to help. It's um, all about, you know, it, here's the way I look at it. If you have a product, right? And this is why I mail daily and I'm not afraid to put, I don't obnoxiously pitch every day. I mean, I give a nice, fun email, but I'll, I always sell something in every email. Because if you have a product that you know can help your market and you're selfishly not telling them it's about it, that it exists often, it, like in my opinion, it's your moral and ethical duty to get it in their hands in an ethical, honest, normal way, no tricking, just using simple salesmanship where you're t- finding out what they want and showing them how to get it. Which, by the way, was something that what I just said there, find out what people want and show them how to get it. That was something Ber- Bernard Baruch, his name was, the, and Gary Bensavanga talked about this guy, the most persuasive man in the 20th century, advised presidents, advised Wall Street power brokers. I mean, he'd get all these guys, these huge egos in a room, and he'd get them all to agree on something. And they asked him at the end of his life, what is the secret of being so persuasive? I'd find out what they want, and I'd show them how to get it. And that's all it really comes down to. Hmm. Yeah. So what is your ritual, Ben, for getting in a good frame of mind to write your email, write your copy? You want to do it at the same time every day so your brain gets used to it. So for me, it's the morning. I just get up and I gag down like a bunch of supplements and I walk <laughs> my dog out to go to the bathroom and I come up to my little treadmill desk here. And I'm, I'm not using the treadmill part, but I'm standing on it right now. Right now, you're on the treadmill desk? Yeah, I'm not. it's not on. I'm just yeah, standing, yeah. like a standing desk now. And I just start working every day. It's not necessarily the same time, but I mean, I, my brain knows it's time to work. And the only way you get there is by doing it and finding out what your time is and, you know, doing it every day at that time. That's how you get your brain into the right rhythm. And it's really, that's really what happens. Your brain gets used to it. And like, if I was to wait till three o'clock to start working, I would have a hard time writing anything. If I just sat around all day, if I did phone calls and all that kind of and interviews in the morning, I would be like out of whack after that. I would have a hard time. My whole day would be shot. That's why I was like, yeah, I got to do this later in the day. Got it. Got it. So what question would be important to address about email marketing that is essential but often gets left out of the conversation that you think is important? Oh, I'll tell you what. Uh, right now, and, and you know, this is getting better, I, people are very worried about open rates and click-through rates and metrics. And I'm not saying those are like don't do that stuff if you want, but very few people talk about sales. So here's the question, you know, what are you more interested in? Getting the email opened or making the sale? Because I can tell you tests have been done. This is I've noticed this in my own business, but tests have been done by other people I don't even know where they've shown they've had higher sales on days where they had lower open rates. <laughs> you know, so it's not open rates don't mean anything. Especially since a lot of uh, computers or a lot of phones, people are checking emails on phones and most phones have HTML turned off by default, so it's not even tracking your opens anyway. So yeah. to me, it's sales, sales, sales. Get it out every day. Get an email out every day. And somebody may have made the decision to buy last week, but that email today just reminded them and got them back in the game. And you just never yeah. know. It's, yeah. it's about consistently getting out there. Yeah, I like that one. I need to listen to that more. Because then when you get in your daily routine, or if you don't get in the daily routine, you just the day kind of takes you wherever it's going to take you. It you know, does. Yeah. It absolutely does. And uh, I do tend to focus, I think, when I look at open rates and things like that also. it's uh, I need to stop that um, to a degree. What about, uh, Ben, and you know, you talk about a lot of mentors, and th- this seems to be a, a big theme, is you learn from the people who are the best and you devour their information. Who's some people that you follow now to keep you, yourself fresh um, that you would consider mentors? Ah, uh, I don't, and I'll tell you why. Not because I don't think I need it, but I'm more into this market focus. Like I've already learned, there's not a whole lot more I'm gonna learn. I mean, there might be some stuff. Like if a guy like Gary Bensavanga had another seminar, believe me, I'd be there taking notes and all that. I loved his first seminar. I mean, there's certain people I would definitely pay to learn from, but they're getting fewer and far between. What I'm more concerned about is the market. So what I do is I read a lot of blogs. 
in the markets that I'm in. And I read, I'm reading the comments and I'm reading what they're talking about now. And especially the comments, especially the stuff that gets them riled up and emotional. That is my mentor in the sense the markets that I'm writing to are really my mentors because I'm getting schooled every day where I thought I knew something and I really didn't or here's some new insight and it's never ending. And I can't learn that from a mentor. I, yeah, you learn the mechanics from a mentor, absolutely. And if, if I can learn from another one, I'll do it. But mostly I'm focused on the market. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. And I want to ask you this too. You know, you talk about... Um, you took out some of your rituals. Um, what made you get a standing desk? Does that make does that make you more productive, or what made you decide to do that? Well, it's a treadmill desk, right? And uh, I'll tell you, um, I had many years ago, like 2008, I have this this uh, acquaintance in business. Her name is Gina Paris, and she did this YouTube video about. It. She says, Ben, check this out. Get one of these. You know, back then they didn't really make treadmill desks. You kind of had to like rig your own, <laughs> and. Studies have been coming up how sitting down all day is really bad for you. Like it's worse than like smoking and drinking and all that. Like sitting down is really bad for you. And I've noticed over the years my back was starting to get tight, getting a little bit of a spare tire, you know, around there. And I don't really – I get bored exercising for long periods of time. But I'd like to keep – you know, I want to get some calories burned. I want to get my – walking in and all that. I have a dog, but I'm not consistent enough with walking her every day. I get bored doing long walks, quite frankly. And uh, so this last, uh, about a, almost a year ago, last, it was like last March or April, I decided to get a treadmill desk. And you know what? I haven't looked back since. It, it I'm, I don't even notice it when I'm on it writing, if I'm typing. And you're just walking at the same time. Yes. I started out at half a mile per hour, the lowest setting. It was really easy. In fact, it got so boring. It, it was actually hard. It was too slow. I do it two miles per hour now. It's the perfect speed for me. I have a little monitor here right next to this that shows me the calories burned, the distance walked, the time I've been, how long I've been walking for, and the speed. It's all right in front of me. So like today, this morning, I probably walked, let's see, I walked, I burned 308 calories, and I walked 3.3 miles before I went to the winery today. So, you know, <laughs> it was good. I mean, but sometimes I'll go longer than that. Sometimes I'll walk five or six miles. I don't know. It just depends. So the weird thing is, is that before when I was sitting down, I had to set a timer. So I'd force myself to get up and walk around. It's different now. Now I get, I get exhausted and I'm like, I got to sit down, man. It's like exhausting. So it's a nice problem to have. And it definitely, I recommend it to everyone. I've written blog posts about it just to get one. It's so good for you. Yeah. And Ben, this is another question I was thinking about. I'm like, what do I ask Ben, the email marketing you know, expert, is one thing I thought about is what should I be doing that I'm probably not with my email marketing? Okay, uh, you should be writing every day, an email every day, seven days a week, um, at least five days a week, if you're not, unless you're already doing that. Are you no. already doing that? No. Okay, that's your first time to do that. Um, doing that alone is going to make you so much better and more productive than anyone that you're probably selling against. Um, emails beget emails. The more you write, the more ideas you're going to get for other ones. And this stuff eventually, is, it, for me, maybe I'm just speaking for myself at this next point, but I actually find it therapeutic. Like today I wrote about, you know, you can't save a damsel in distress if she likes her distress. That was a real life story. Actually, it was therapeutic for me to write about that because that was weighing heavily on my mind for several months, that situation. It's therapeutic. You know, and people identify with that because they all everybody has problems. A lot of us all have the same problems. We just don't all talk about it, and it's not all the same manner. But you know, people like to read that. You're actually doing your market a favor. They, I, I'm telling you, I, look, there are better writers than me out there. Okay, I'm the first to admit it. But I have a pretty strong audience. Like I was hanging out with one of my friends today, and she's like telling the girl at the working at the winery. She's like, yeah, every morning I wake up, I get my phone, I delete, I I scroll through all my emails. I delete everything that I don't really need, and then I, I got my mind free to read Ben's email. And, and you know, big compliment. I've heard that before. But you know what? You, it'll happen to you too. Once if people, it's like a talk radio show. People come to expect to hear from you. They want to hear from you. You'll get emails on days you don't email because like Ben, where's the email? They'll do that. Are too. there I days can't. that you feel that you don't have anything to write about? No, be, there are days where I'm burned out. But see. On those days, I've written so many emails, right? I've written like thousands of, I don't know how many emails I've written, a lot. I'll go back a year in my autoresponder and just reuse something I used before. I'll do that for three days straight if I get burned out. 
that's another reason to get as many out there as you can. You can go six months back. Nobody's even going to remember the first time you saw right. If they do, so what? You know, it's not a big deal. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so I recycle. But I also have a, a list of like 700 email ideas. So I'm never going to run out of stuff. So what is, I always like to ask top copywriters too about some of your favorite headlines. The ones that I've written? Yeah. Or other, or okay, other well, ones you've written or others you've used as inspiration. Okay, well, I'm gonna. I, I wrote this long one down because I mentioned Captain Chris Pizzo in the self defense market. This basically, this ad I wrote for him back in 2008 was a control. I mean, it ran, and this headline specifically, he would use like on DrudgeReport.com, like big sites, right? He was advertising on, and it never really changed, other than a word or two he had to change around. It was basically just kept running for like four, I don't know how many, years, four or five years, and I think he just took it down like last year, so five years straight. And that was this. And this was, a, by the way, a headline I wrote based on the market. It had nothing to do with the product, as you're about to hear. Uh, it was warning. Don't read this if you have moral, ethical, or religious reasons against hurting or even killing someone who violently attacks you, your wife, or your kids. That is an emotional headline. There's nothing about a product. There's nothing for sale. That thing ran forever. And there was another one I pulled up here that I'm going to read to you that this was one of my favorite. Ads. I think if like I wrote this ad, it was so much fun to write this particular ad here that I'm about to read the headline for that I would have done it for free. I mean, it was just so fun. And what that was is fun about it because this client would, I could not be too violent for this guy. Like I, would, <laughs> I might thought I'm going too far. He's like, no, 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 just go as far as you want. I mean, it was just like, I talk about therapeutic. When you maybe this is why I like writing my zombie book so much. I could just it, it's like I'm letting all this dark energy out of me under the page. You know what I mean? Like everybody has angst and stuff, and some people go to a psychologist for it. I just write, and it just comes out. And and this one was how even skinny quote Barney Fife cops single handedly control and dominate violent criminals, gangbangers, and other cold blooded killers without even drawing their guns. And that was for a product um, that shows you how to fight like street, like inner city cops. And that thing just killed it. I mean, he said he said they made like 30 grand the first day they ran it and he was just like and they he took doesn't the day run off. It anymore. They're not he's not actually he does not have this business anymore. Oh. So he took all these ads down. He doesn't sell the products. He never he was starting to hate being in that market after a while. I'm not sure what he's doing now. Yeah. I have no idea what he's doing now. But uh he might have gotten into like software or something, but So anyone out there in the self defense should call you and partner with you with all your uh I don't oh. want you know what I'm done with that niche um I just have no interest in it anymore it was fun while it was lasted but I'm in, I'm working right now as a side niche I'm working in the dating niche which I think is far more fun cuz I'm a single guy I'm in the niche I know how these people are thinking I'm one of them I mean it's easy and it's fun and it's therapeutic I get to write about all my dates I get to write about the the girls I'm dating and stuff and it's and I get to turn it into sales and you know, there's nothing more fun than writing in a market that you're a part of because you get to you basically just tell your own stories. So what's a single guy in the dating niche scared of? Probably being found out that I'm working in the dating niche. By, you, know I mean? like, <laughs> you know, like like I don't work. That's under, not the I, typical one. though. I mean, you're you're atypical. I mean, not you per, per se, but like someone, you know, some single male. What are they scared of? Oh man, these guys are scared of being alone. They're scared of getting married and then divorced and then having all their assets and their children taken away by a corrupt family court. That's a big one. They're scared that they're never going to find a good girl. There's a lot of low class jackass women out there, guys too. And that's isn't that like anti one. I'm just saying from a guy's point of view. Uh, there's a lot of girls that won't give them the time of day. Yeah. Um, they just, they're, they're good guys. They work hard, but they're being dumped for some loser. Because the loser knows how to be more dominant than they do, and that's what they need to learn is confidence and dominance. And it's, but they're scared. They they are scared of all this. That they're scared that they're always going to be alone. And they're they're, they're going to end up with some girl that they don't find attractive just to settle down, or you know, or whatever. And they're mostly scared of being cheated on. Because really? they hear a lot of guys are scared of that. A lot of guys get cheated on. You know, you don't hear about it in the in the mass market. You don't hear about it in the culture. It's always the guys, the bad guy. Most guys, I would say, eighty percent of guys are good guys. They have no, they don't want to hurt anybody. They're not going to cheat. They just want to work their, do their work. They want to go to work. They want to come home to a good person. They don't want to have to battle the girl that they're with. They don't want to have to be getting dealing with disagreeable people and all this. They don't want a girl that acts like a guy, basically. 
And, you know, by the way, in a girl's defense, they're acting that way because a lot of guys don't act like men. They act like women. And so this is a lot of this is a lot of the psychology that goes on in this market right now. Hmm. And they're very angry. Almost every guy in this market has been cheated on or done wrong, unfairly by somebody. And that's why they turn into like, you know, they get real angry. If they don't find some kind of like solution, they start doing bad things and, you know, they'll start treating women like crap and stuff. And so it's a very interesting market. I think it's one of those, I think it's the new martial arts market. I've been saying to people like, there was a time when every copywriter wanted to get in the martial arts market because it's so fun. I'm not the only one that's fun writing those hats, okay? I think this is the new one. We'll see. I think it will be the new one. And I, I could be wrong about that, but it'll be the new martial arts or like the new golf market. It'll just be really hot. So yeah, I'm glad yeah. to be in it well, now while it's still young. Yeah, Ben, so I have one last question for you, and I appreciate your time. And before I ask it, just tell people more about where they can find you, what's going on lately. Okay, well, you can find me the best – the only place you should look for me is at my main website, bensettle.com. And when you go there, you're going to see a, uh, just an opt-in box. And if you opt into it, you'll get a, you'll get on my mailing list. But you'll also get a free issue of my email player's newsletter. Not print. It'll be a PDF for the first issue. It contains 24 different ways to make – to boost your profits with email. People have told me they have used that – made you know several thousand dollars the first time because they were like oh i could just use these tricks and all that it's free you don't have to get on the list you can bypass it and go straight to the blog and read everything for free i have a media page where all these i i put interviews i've done up on there and it's like a thousand pages worth of stuff so bensettle.com love it thanks ben and my last question is you have a show it's called antipreneur yes right and so yes. why do you call it antipreneur and tell me about I know that you put a lot of thought into everything. Why the picture? You're drinking a mug. Uh, I think you're drinking a mug of beer, right? Yes. Uh, yes. So tell me why antipreneur and then why the picture? Okay. Well, the, the picture – okay. First, I'll start with why antipreneur. Actually, I did not coin the term antipreneur. My producer, Jonathan, did. Um, I am a big proponent of a pro, uh, concept I did name, as far as I know, called ant being an antiprofessional. Think of the anti-heroes in literature. Think of like the Incredible Hulk. Okay, Think of like Dexter in the show Dexter. These are not villains, but they're not really heroes. They're anti-heroes, meaning they do their own thing going their own way. They're not doing things to hurt anyone. They're trying to help people actually, but they're not going along with the established rules of things. And the way I do things, this is how I am. Like I don't, I don't kiss butt. Um, I will actually tell people, look, don't buy for me if it's not going to make sense. Um, I'm going to go my own way. I'm going to do things my own way. I'm going to create, I'm going to sell a print newsletter just because everyone's selling, telling me to do an email because I know this is what works. It's kind of like you're the man, like the man or woman on your horse. Okay. This mostly works for guys, actually. A lot of women cannot pull this off without coming off as too abrasive. They have to be careful with this. But you're like the man on your horse, right? You're riding along, you're, you're going to do things your way. You never try to impress the customers, but you get the sale. You know what I mean? It's that. It's not because it's not an act. It's just that's how I think. Mm -hmm. And so I created. I this think people can glean that from the interview. You, oh, okay, you have well, that. I mean, I could, <laughs> not in a bad way. Just that right. you have. Um, you know, if someone's saying, you know, push the free line, you're saying don't push the free line. You know, you're you're kind of doing things, not against the grain, but but just how you think it should be done, even if other yes. people are saying this is how it should be done. Absolutely, and it's not to purposely be controversial. It's just I honestly don't believe in that stuff. I do things based on principle, not tactics. And this is a big difference between what I do and other people do. I'm, and I learned this from a guy named Jim Camp, who's known as the most feared negotiator on the planet. And he's big on doing things out of principle, not tactics. And so that's really what being, in my opinion, anti-professional is. You have a set of principles of ethic that you're going to go by. And people can either go along with it or they, can, or they don't. And it's up to them. And I don't try to like hang on to them or anything. It is what it is. So that's what that is. So um, my producer, Jonathan, said, well, let's call it antipreneur instead of entrepreneur. I just thought that was brilliant. I'm like, dude, that is perfect. So that's the reason for the name of that show. The picture I've had up for a long time, I used to use it on my main squeeze page. It's just different. It stands out. Um, I call it my uh, – I call it my uh, – what's the guy – the man in the Hathaway shirt ad, which is something the great ad man David Ogilvy did, where back in the day there was this guy had like this 
he had this model of doing like these like rugged type of ads, but he's like, you know, this guy just doesn't look right. So they put like this eye patch on him. <laughs> and what? suddenly sales just like exploded for everything. Really? It's like now he really looked dashing and kind of dangerous, you know, <laughs> like an eye patch on just an eye patch. And this is like my version of the Hathaway shirt. It's not dangerous or anything, but it's just different. It it sticks out. Yeah. And it's my personality. It, I like a good beer, you know, it's just different. And it was funny because after I put that up and stuff, there were people trying to copy it and they just couldn't figure out what made it work. But so that's the reason I put that on the Entrepreneur Show. I took it off my main site. I use it on social media still, though. I just think it's funny. It amuses me. Yeah, so if you reason. see my iTunes or my picture on my main page with an eye patch, now you know why. I think you should do that, yeah. dude. I really do. <laughs> ben, I really appreciate your time. Uh, it's been an honor and a pleasure. Thanks so much. You got it. Thank you for having me. I really had fun. Thank you. Me too.